بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على عبد الله ورسوله نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما يا حي يا قيوم So we begin with the praise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala We praise him we seek his help and we ask for his forgiveness. We also begin by sending peace and blessings and salutations upon our messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and upon his family and his companions. And then I would like to begin before I start the course with just a couple of very simple things inshallah ta'ala. First of all, I would like to begin by thanking Allah Azza wa Jal first and foremost because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with his help and his tawfiq we're able to organize this course here today and if it were not for the help of Allah Azza wa Jal we would not have been able to do it and then extending my thanks to Jamir Salaf for all of their hard work they put in so much work for me to be able to come here today uh, and all of their hospitality uh, and their support and likewise all of the other organizations and groups that have been involved in supporting us during this time we ask Allah to make it in the scale of their good deeds Yawm al Qiyamah so we begin by asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to teach us what benefits us and to benefit us with what he teaches us and to increase us in knowledge I would like to start by introducing myself and the reason I'd like to start by introducing myself is because I think since this is the first time that I've ever been to the Maldives it would be nice to just maybe t tell you a little bit about myself and I will make it particular to the topic as well uh, how I started with al Ruqya Shar'iyya and inshallah yani, who, a little bit about myself so uh, we have some notes on the screen behind us. Don't worry too much about them. They're not like uh, what I say. I, I'm just going to repeat what, I, what is written there anyway. And also, uh, I will be sending, inshallah ta'ala, out uh, an email copy of all of the notes, inshallah. So you don't have to worry too much if you can't see it. Or I, I mean, I can zoom in and zoom out, but you don't have to worry too much about it. So the first thing I usually deal with is a bit about myself. So, of course, you know my name is Muhammad Tim Humble. And that's a funny name. It's made up of two parts, Muhammad and Tim. So the Tim part came from when I was, uh, when I was born. I, I became Muslim 21 years ago by the grace of Allah Azza wa Jal and His mercy. And I became Muslim in a city called Newcastle upon Tyne in the UK. And uh, inshallah ta'ala, in some of the talks that are coming up uh, in, the, in the coming days, inshallah ta'ala, I might talk a little bit about how that happened. But in any case, uh, the next important thing about me is that I was blessed again after Allah blessed me with Islam. Allah Azza wa Jal blessed me being able to go to the Islamic University of Medina, where I, I spent six and a half years by the grace of Allah Azza wa Jal. And it was towards the middle of that time. It was in the middle of that time, probably around 2006, maybe 2007, that I first got into the topic of Rukia. And very briefly, I think I'd always been interested in Rukia. Everybody always talks about Rukia, and I had bought a few books, but it wasn't something I knew a lot about. And a friend of mine told me that uh, a family member of his had become very, very sick and that he suspected that it could be magic. And he said, since you are the only student from our city who is in the Islamic University of Medina, I thought I would come to you and I would ask you what to do. Because it seems to me that this sickness is not usual 
it seems to be strange and unusual. And I said, Wallah, I have some books, but I don't know much about it. Let me go back to Medina, or let me, in Medina, I don't remember if I was there or if I was in the UK, but in any case, let me go and find one of the scholars and ask him about it. So I had a mentor when I was in Medina, somebody who helped me a great deal, Sheikh Abdul Basit, uh, Dr. Abdul Basit uh, Fahim, who helped me a lot. And he was in that time doing his master's degree in tafsir. So I said to him, do you know somebody in this field? Because I have some questions. He said, yes, my teacher who is supervising my thesis is an expert in this field. You have to come and meet him. He will help you a lot. Bi'idhnillah. So I went and I met Sheikh Ali bin Ghazi Tawajiri, Hafizahullah Ta'ala, and I began learning Ruqya in a lot more detail. The Sheikh gave me a, a book of his. I've partially translated the book uh, and it's available for you guys to, to, to read, inshallah. We'll send you the PDF. I've taken pieces out of it. And I began learning. And that was just the beginning, really. I remember the first Rukia case that I ever did. Like I said, it was probably 2007, something like that. And I remember phoning the Sheikh every, you know, every 10 minutes, every half an hour, Sheikh, what shall I do now? Sheikh, what do I do now? Sheikh, I'm stuck. And from then on, it just became something bigger by the grace of Allah Azza wa Jal. And I was able to continue. And I was able to meet many of the Mashaykh. And one of the Mashaykh who had a big impact on me in Ruqya was Sheikh Adil bin Tahir al-Muqbil, Hafizahullah Ta'ala. And the Sheikh, uh, he was the head of catching magicians in Riyadh for the Hayat uh, al-Amr bil Ma'roof wa Nahi al-Munkar. And he was there for a very many, many, many years, became a, a world-renowned expert in magic and magicians. And I was able to meet him and accompany him in the UK for a short time uh, and uh, to benefit from his work that he did on amulets and understanding them and the way that magic works and so on and his seven day program which I translated into English and I think a lot of people have heard of that program now uh, by the grace of Allah Azza wa Jal. So Alhamdulillah I've been doing Rukya, I've been teaching Rukya for over 10 years now. Uh, probably it's now coming 11 years or 12 years and, and teaching wise uh, nearly 10 years of teaching Rukya. And I think this course that I'm doing now is going to be taken from different places. So it's not going to be taken from just one of my courses. It's not like I have the same course and I just, you know, like we do the same one in the Maldives, then the same one in the UK, then the same one in Dubai, then the same one in Malaysia, then the same. We, instead, what I do is I'm going to choose the parts that I think you need the most, inshallah ta'ala. And so basically, I'm going to take from three different courses, and I'm going to take a piece from each one and put it together over two days, inshallah ta'ala. So the first sort of segment is quite, it's a little bit of theory. It's a little bit of understanding so that we understand the topic. Because we should start at a stage where all of us understand what is being said, and all of us understand the terminology, and all of us understand the you know, that maybe remove some misconceptions that people have. In the second segment, which will be this afternoon, inshallah ta'ala, we want to talk about the Qur'an as a cure, the practicality. How do you practically start and implement ruqya for yourself, for your family, for the people around you? And then, inshallah ta'ala, tomorrow, we're going to take from some of the work of Sheikh Adil, and we're going to look at the ta'weed and how, where they came from and magic in some detail and what they put on the amulets and the things that people tie around their necks and what they mean. 
And then inshallah ta'ala, we'll have time for question and answers and that's the fourth component. So there's kind of three or four major parts to this course. So each one will be very different. So do try to attend all of the parts of the course inshallah ta'ala because each one is going to be very different. What we do this morning will be very different from what we do this afternoon and what we do tomorrow morning ta'ala, will be very different from what we have done today. So each one is going to be different and maybe in your own personal situation, different parts of the course will benefit you more. Maybe some of you need the theoretical uh, information or it will help you a lot. For some of you, you want the practical implementation. For some of you, you want to know more about the amulets and so on. So inshallah ta'ala, we're going to try to provide a little piece of everything. That being said, there are a number of video resources available online. So please do, uh, we will inshallah email those out as well. We will send those out in, in the email. The previous videos and workshops. Because if I've done, I've done something like 20, maybe 20 workshops. And maybe five or six of them are recorded and each one is different. So in, you know, instead of just giving you uh, like a repeat, inshallah, we will also refer you to those to be able to, inshallah, go into some more detail. Bi'idhnillahi ta'ala. Okay. So... This first half an hour, or this first hour, the half of it is gone. This first half an hour, inshallah ta'ala, we just want to start with an introduction to some principles that we're going to need to help us to go forward. And these principles, they do relate to ruqya, but they are general. They are more general principles that we need in order to help us to go forward. And the first one is under this title here. A word about the unseen. So we're going to be talking about the ghaib. About the unseen. So what we're going to talk about today is from the matters of the unseen. No, none of us can see the jinn on a regular basis in their regular form. Maybe some people who have a sickness can see some, you know, some movements, some images, sometimes some shapes appear or some things appear to them. But in general, us as human beings, we can't see the jinn. Allah Azza wa Jal told us this. Innahu yarakum huwa wa qabiluhu min haythu la tarawnahum. He and his tribe See you from where you can't see them. Meaning, Iblis, as a jinni, Iblis was from the jinn, كَانَ مِنَ الْجِنِّ فَفَسَقَ عَنْ أَمْرِ رَبِّهِ He was among the jinn. And he disobeyed the command of his Lord. So Iblis and his people, the jinn, they see you from where you can't see them. And that tells us that this issue of the jinn is from the unseen. Likewise, a sihr, magic, it's from the unseen. We can't see the, you know, like if somebody shoots an arrow at you, and they take a bow, they shoot an arrow at you. You can see the arrow, and you can see it flying through the air, and you can see it stuck inside the person. You know, he said, I've been shot in my shoulder. You can see it. But magic, you can't see it. You can't look at somebody and say, okay, you got hit in the, in the eye. By magic. You can't see it. And likewise the evil eye. If somebody gives the evil eye to somebody, that person may fall down dead on the floor. They may fall down on the floor, they may even die. And you cannot see anything wrong with them. You can't see anything. So that means that what we are dealing with here is from the unseen. From the things that we can't see. And believing in things that we can't see is from one of the most important characteristics of a Muslim. Allah Azza wa Jal told us in Surah Al-Baqarah, الَّذِينَ يُؤْمِنُونَ بِالْغَيْبِ وَيُقِيمُونَ الصَّلَاةِ وَمِمَّا رَزَقْنَاهُمْ يُنْفِقُونَ Those people who believe in the ghayb. Look at the very beginning of Surah Al-Baqarah. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the very beginning of the Quran, the first thing in Surah Al-Baqarah that Allah described the believers with. Hudan lil muttaqin, the people of taqwa, after describing them with taqwa, is he described them as Alladina Yu'minuna Bil Ghaib. The people who believe in the Ghaib. Okay. So what is the Ghaib that we believe in? The most important matter of the ghayb that we believe in is we believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because we cannot see Allah azza wa jal. We will not see Allah until we die. As the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us, you will not see your Lord hatta tamutu, until you die. So at this moment in time, our belief in Allah, our belief in the angels, our belief in paradise, our belief in hellfire, all of these things are from the ghaib, from al iman bil ghaib. And from al iman bil ghaib is to believe in the things which the Prophet ﷺ told us about, which we cannot see. The things which the Prophet ﷺ told us about, which we cannot see. Or we cannot know about because they haven't happened yet or because they're from a different world. And that's part of believing that Muhammad وسلم, is the messenger of Allah. Because we define believing that Muhammad وسلم, is the messenger of Allah as being ta'atuhu fima amar wa tasdiquhu fima akhbar wa an la yu'badu Allah illa bima shara'a. We define it as being, obeying him in what he commanded and believing him in what he told us and only worshipping Allah in the way that he showed us. That's what it means to say that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the messenger of Allah. And so this belief in the unseen is really fundamental. So where do we get knowledge about the unseen? If I want to know about the jinn, I want to know about sihr, I want to know about the evil eye, I want to know about the way that it works, and I want to know about how to cure it or how to treat it, how can I, how can I find out about that? Our only source of knowledge about the unseen is the Qur'an and the sunnah. And there's a reason for that. There's a beautiful statement of the ulama, the scholars of Islam. They said, you can only know about something in three ways. There are only three ways you can know about anything. There are only three ways that you can know about anything. Number one, you see it. And you see it you, with your senses. You see it, you hear it, you touch it, you taste it. And you directly see it. Or you compare it to something else that you know about. So you compare it. Somebody says to you, it's like this. Or you have somebody reliable inform you about it. So if we cannot see the world of the jinn, and we really can't compare it to anything that we can understand, not easily anyway, not all of it, then we are left with the third one. We are left with what we have been told from a reliable source. So who is a reliable source? The only reliable source that we have is the Qur'an and the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That's where we're going to get our knowledge from. And Allah Azza wa Jal said, "Inna Allaha indahu ilmu saa'a wa yunazzilu ghayth wa ya'lamu ma fil arham wa ma tadri nafsun madha taksibu ghada wa ma tadri nafsun bi ayyi ardin tamut inna Allaha latifun khabir." In Surah Luqman, indeed Allah has the knowledge of the hour and he sends down the rain and he knows what is in the wombs. And nobody knows what it will earn tomorrow and no soul knows where in which land it will die. Indeed Allah is Latif, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is alimun khabir. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is alim, he's all knowledgeable, 
and he is khabir. He is alim, he is all knowledgeable, and he is khabir. Nah. We can't take knowledge of the unseen from so-called holy people. Even the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was told to say, Kulla aqulu lakum indi khazain Allah, wala a'lamu al ghayb, wala aqulu lakum inni malak, in attabi'u illa ma yuha ilay, kul hal yastawi al a'ma wal basir, afala tatafakkaru. Say, I don't say to you that I have the provisions of Allah and I don't know the unseen. And I don't say to you that I'm an angel. I only follow what is revealed to me. Say, is the blind person equivalent to the one who sees? Will you not give them thought? And in this point here, I want to, I want to also highlight another ayah in the Quran. And the ayah that I want to highlight is this ayah here from Surah Al-Hujarat. Ya ayyuha alladheena amanu لا تقدم بين يدي الله ورسوله واتقوا الله إن الله سميع عليم. Oh, you who believe, don't put yourself forward before Allah and His Messenger and protect yourself from the punishment of Allah. Indeed, Allah is all hearing and all knowing. Oh, you who believe, don't put yourself before Allah. And his messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And this ayah, the reason I'm highlighting this ayah for you and I'm, I'm putting emphasis on this ayah here for you is because I want to highlight something which is the role of experience and personal theories when it comes to ruqya sharia. A lot of people have got their own ideas. You will hear, if you listen to lectures about Ruqya, you will hear from everybody saying every different kind of thing. But at the end of the day, we put the Quran and the Sunnah before all of those things and before all of those people. There's nothing wrong with using experience. But we shouldn't allow experience to come before the Quran and the Sunnah. This is very important. We should not allow experience to come in front of the Quran and the Sunnah. So experience plays a role in Ruqya. And we're going to hear about that later on from a hadith in which the Prophet ﷺ told or, or allowed us to use our experience in Ruqya. However, we should never allow our experience to, to override and to overrule the Qur'an and the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So this is interesting because in Ruqya you have two camps. We were talking about this yesterday. You have two groups of people. One of them is over here, one of them is over here. One of them says... You cannot use experience in Ruqya at all. Nothing. Nothing, zero. Everything has to have an ayah or hadith for it. Okay. This is on this side. On the other side, you have another group. And they say that experience is everything. And that what you will find in the Quran and the Sunnah is not enough. It will not be enough for you. You need to learn your extra things from your experience and the experience of the people who came before you. What is the correct answer? The correct answer is right here, in the middle. The correct answer is in the middle. It is that we put the Quran and the Sunnah ahead of our experience. We benefit from our experience for two reasons. Number one, because the Prophet ﷺ in an authentic hadith allowed us to use our experience in Ruqya. He allowed us. He allowed us. When he said, 
علي رقاكم شو مي يو رقيا فأذن ما لم فأذن فيه ما لم يكن شركا whatever was not shirk whatever was not making a partner with Allah he allowed it so he allowed experience he allowed you to use your experience but he taught us how to do ruqya properly and he taught us the principles of ruqya and so we stay within those principles and we use the Quran and the Sunnah as our primary source of information. Our experience comes second. And this hadith, the hadith, show me your ruqya, it actually gives us this benefit. Because what it does is it actually says, take your experience and put it against the Quran and the Sunnah. And when you find it agreeing with the Quran and the Sunnah, Take it. And when you find it disagreeing with the Quran and the Sunnah, leave it. This hadith on its own is a perfect example of why we should be in the middle. Use your experience, but don't let it go over the boundaries that Islam has set. And the second reason why we can use our experience is because this is a matter of ijma', a matter of consensus. And the consensus was narrated by Al-Imam Al-Hafidh ibn Hajar rahimahullah ta'ala and Al-Imam Al-Nawawi rahimahullah ta'ala who narrated that there is consensus on the permissibility of ruqya as long as it is from the Qur'an and the names of Allah and the, uh, yani the, the authentic words that are reported and as long as it is in a clear language that can be understood and so on and we're going to mention this. So this tells us that we need to be in the middle. We can benefit from experience, but we shouldn't make experience the thing which tells us how to perform ruqya from the beginning to the end. First of all, we put the Qur'an and the Sunnah, and we take everything we can from the Qur'an and the Sunnah, because our experience might be right and it might be wrong. It's not wahi, it's not revelation. It could be right, and it could be wrong. But the Qur'an and the Sunnah is 100% right. So we're going to put the Qur'an and the Sunnah first. And then we're going to fill in whatever we need with whatever experience we have. Bearing in mind that our experience might be wrong. So this brings me to, to this point. That those things which are clearly mentioned in the Qur'an and the Sunnah, we accept them without any disagreement. Then we have those things which are from the actions of the scholars. And this is not a proof, but it's, I mean, their experience is worth more than mine. And then we have our own experience. And we want to distinguish between these three things. Number one, Number two, number three. Number one, those things which are clearly mentioned in the Qur'an and the Sunnah or consensus. Number two, those things which were mentioned by the scholars and the imams of this science. And number three, those things which are from our own experience. And we're going to rank it like that. This is, you know, place number one, we always accept it. Number two, we generally accept it. Number three... We accept if it doesn't contradict these two. So we don't want to put ourselves in front of the Quran and the Sunnah. We can use our experience to suggest something, but it's not a conclusive proof. And the other thing is that it is permissible for you to disagree with my experience. Nobody, there's nothing wrong with that. You can come and say, Muhammad Tim, your opinion about this, your theory about this, I don't agree with it. But are you allowed to say about an ayah or a hadith, I don't agree with it? No. وَمَا كَانَ لِمُؤْمِنٍ وَلَا مُؤْمِنَةٍ إِذَا قَضَى اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ أَمْرًا أَنْ يَكُونَ لَهُمُ الْخِيَرَةُ مِنْ أَمْرِهِمْ It's not for a believing man or a believing woman if Allah and His Messenger decided something that they should have any 
choice in the matter.